Welcome to the Barrier Breakdown, Disrupting Mental Health Podcast, where we talk about the clinical and practical issues that face those working in the mental health industry. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the Barrier Breakdown. My name is Erin Molino Bailey. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Cognitive Behavior Institute, and my co host, Dr. Kevin Caridad, who is the CEO and owner at Cognitive Behavior Institute. This week, we are joined by Dr. Mayan Simkis, and we are, will be discussing the topic of policing and population health. Dr. Simkis is an epidemiologist in Washington State who completed her master's in public health at the St. Louis College for Public Health and Social Justice and her PhD at the University of Washington in Seattle. Dr. Mayan's research, doctoral research examines the complex relationship between po policing and population health. She is passionate about moving the field of public health towards more equitable and inclusive practices that promote social justice across policies, programs, and systems. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Simkis. Uh, can you share with us and our listeners a little bit about how you first got interested in public health? Absolutely. I am sort of a weird one. I got interested in public health early in my life. I think a lot of people land in the public health world after kind of a meandering path through other fields. But uh, my stepdad was in public health when I was pretty young. And I had a really unusual opportunity at the age of 16. I was uh, freakishly fluent in Spanish, having grown up bilingual myself in other languages and ended up traveling with a group of researchers from a university in St. Louis to the small Andean town of La Oroya, Peru. And I was there for a number of weeks helping as a translator and an environmental sampler in a lead mining community. So this is a community with people um, living in a space that is really dominated by a refinery, a metal refinery. So folks were going to this refinery every day. It's the main source of income, tremendous lead in the population. And there were real concerns over the years led by you know, community voices that lead poisoning was a problem. And so we were part of a group of local and international researchers and practitioners gathering information to support local efforts to improve the health of the community. And it was a pretty life altering experience. I was out there taking dust samples and water samples, working with community members very closely. And it really showed me the importance of not only serving our communities, but doing it with communities hand in hand. And I really developed a passion for social justice, for health and well being of communities, and for figuring out ways to dedicate a career to positively influencing the world. That's fascinating. Um, it sounds like you certainly got a lot of real lived in experience um, with your experiences. So um, thank you so much for sharing that. That's very interesting. Um, you had recently published an article in Social Science and Medicine entitled The Adverse Effects of Policing on Population Health, a Conceptual Model. Can you talk us through that conceptual model and how you and your co-authors developed it? I absolutely can. And I'll start just by saying epidemiology has become a name or a term, a term that people are more familiar with over the past uh, you know, year and a half, as one can imagine. But people don't necessarily understand what that means. And you're, you may be wondering why you have an epidemiologist talking to a bunch of clinicians and mental health. Well, first of all, as a um, a regular with my mental health providers and as a huge supporter of reducing stigma around mental health, I just want to thank everybody who's listening uh, because at least I can say my own mental health care providers have had a huge impact on my life. So let me preface this whole conversation with that. So epidemiologists, we are looking at data and trends in populations to understand the health and well-being of our populations and to look at ways to improve health over time, reduce inequities in health across different groups, but also to describe what we're seeing so we can design programs that are effective. So my interest in doing something relating to policing stems back to where I grew up. I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. I grew up in a pretty privileged white middle-class family. Uh, I did have three half siblings though, much younger than me, who I really helped to raise. And all of them are biracial, half black and half white. And I saw what the experiences were like in my own family. I saw the experiences in my community. And I started from an early age in programs that really got me 
um, including that time in Peru, very engaged in the idea of social justice as a career path. How do we truly make social justice part of everything that we do? So when I got to my PhD, I had been working in epidemiology in Missouri and in Boston a bit and in Oregon and then up in Washington state. And I knew that I wanted to dedicate my doctoral studies to something that would have an immediate public health impact that often goes understudied and that I felt like would be a real challenge while also you know, shedding a light on an area of public health that is often not called public health. So I knew that I wanted to do work related to the intersection of policing and health. It's getting more attention. There are researchers out there, including Nancy Krieger out of um, the Boston area at Harvard and others who are really have many for many years have been calling for policing to be treated as a health issue. But I knew that it was important for us to spend some more time dissecting what it truly means to say policing is a public health or population health issue. So it started with an interest in looking at what kind of data we have. The data on policing and health is lousy. It's really bad. And for an epidemiologist to choose that data, not the most common choice. It's a little bit unusual. But at, again, to me, it was about the social justice component. Just because something doesn't have good data doesn't mean we shouldn't look at it. In fact, it probably means we should look at it even more. So the intention with this effort really has been to understand how policing and population health are related and to look at all of these very diverse fields of study from psychology and sociology to public health and criminal justice and understand the intersection of all of those fields on a really important and pressing topic. So in social science and medicine, we published a conceptual framework that describes the relationship between policing and population health and a few different steps along the way. So again, this is a very complicated relationship. Law enforcement affects all aspects of our lives as individuals and in communities and the systems and structures we live within. And our health and well-being span those structures as well. So in order to depict what this relationship really looks like, we needed to break it down a bit. So let's start with the big picture. Policing and health are related to each other and it's bi-directional. Policing affects population health and the health and well-being of a population influences how that population is policed. It's a bit of a chicken and the egg situation, right? You have to decide which one comes first. In reality, nothing came first. It's all happening cyclically. The next big picture thing to keep in mind is the context. When we talk about policing and health, the context matters. The health and policing relationship in Baltimore looks different than Seattle, looks different than St. Louis, looks different than Minneapolis, looks different than Springfield, Illinois. So we need to remember the historical context of the area, the cultural context, the state and the local policies that might be relevant, and also the crime and, and violence patterns in the community, which we'll talk a little bit more about, I'm sure. So when I think about the relevance of having a model like this, I think about the way it's going to be applied and how people are going to interpret it. The first sort of piece of the model that we'll dive into are really the exposures. What are the types of ways an individual can be exposed to the concept or the system of law enforcement? So there's the really obvious police community encounter. You have a person who is walking across the street and an officer directs traffic and they're walking past the officer and they wave. Or there's a person who is at a protest and they have a direct encounter talking to a police officer while they're at that protest. That also would be considered a direct police community encounter. We also could have people who are engaging or being exposed to policing through media or through social media. They're watching stories online. They watch a TikTok thing and, you know, they see something with an officer come up. Maybe it's happy. Maybe it's not. Another could be the atmosphere and the tone of policing and community relations. This is a bit trickier, but if you imagine the community where you grew up, what did you think about when you thought about law enforcement? Were you thinking, ah, yes, when I see an officer, I know I can go to them and ask for help if I need it. Or were you thinking, we don't talk to the police. When the police show up, I get nervous. So that general tone and the, the atmosphere about that sort of describes the way people are, are relating to law enforcement is another big type of exposure. The last one has to do with policies and enforcement. So there are different policing policies or law enforcement policies that are certainly federal, but there are differences in local as well. 
And the enforcement or application of those policies is gonna differ in different communities. We already know, and there's tremendous data, indicating that communities of color and communities of lower socioeconomic status are policed differently than other communities, particularly the white, more well-to-do communities. For example, different communities are policed around drugs differently. If you look at the population that is incarcerated for substance use, it is going to be disproportionately black and brown individuals who are incarcerated because of substance use. When in reality, there are certain substances that are used at much greater rates among other segments of the population, including among white, wealthy or middle class individuals, but because the policies and the enforcement of those policies is inequitable across different communities, when we look at who's truly incarcerated, that's not a great representation of the actual use within the population. So once we think about the exposures, the types of ways people can be exposed to law enforcement as a concept, as an institution, it's helpful to think about the mechanisms and particularly for clinical providers, I think this is a really important point. That is, there is the obvious direct personal experience with law enforcement, and then there is an indirect or vicarious experience or mechanism. So when we think of direct experiences, I mean interacting with the law enforcement officer, being at a protest and actually being face to face. When I talk about indirect or vicarious exposure, I mean more through social media or simply by being a person of color in a community and seeing how policing is sort of implemented around into the people around you. A vicarious exposure, for example, could be uh, that my family member has been affected by law enforcement in their past and they talk about it in our family. And it's something I learn about within my family. I didn't have a direct experience, let's say with that officer that my parent perhaps had five, six, 10 years ago, but I hear about it. I also see the social media posts and I hear the talking heads on the news. And I hear how those talking heads talk about people who look like me or who live in the place where I live or people who attended a particular protest or not. So those vicarious exposures we already know can have a real impact that is tangible and measurable on our well-being. So we've talked about exposures, we've talked about the mechanisms, but what actually happens as a result has to do with the effects, right? What are the effects of the exposures and the mechanisms on our health and well-being? How does policing ultimately get embodied in our, in our well-being? What happens? So when we think about the effects of policing, there are three levels. I mentioned them earlier. One is individual level, me as a person. The next is community, which could be me, my family, my neighborhood, uh, or people who look like me all around the country, some other entity or population group. A community doesn't have to be geographically located, right? And then the last is systems. Systems are those structures that we live in. So if I think about the short and long-term health effects of policing, I'm looking at the, the sort of variation over time and what those effects can look like, meaning there can be something that affects me now. It could show up later for the first time. It could kind of come and go and be periodic. It could also be something that affects me now that leads to long, long uh, term effects later and it's sort of a chain of effects back and forth. So for an individual, you can obviously have a physical injury uh, or experience death as a short term effect, those are pretty immediate. But those sort of short term effects can lead to other things like longer term physical health changes, through increases in allostatic load and stress, we see that blood pressure, anxiety, mental health, all of these things can be affected by a short-term quick exposure to law enforcement. Behavior change can also be a result within an individual. Maybe I'll stop calling law enforcement when they have an issue and I try to call somebody else because I'm nervous about what might happen. We can also see, as I mentioned, death, which will have obviously a short-term implication, but in the long term, we might experience, you know, seeing an individual who dies many years later as a result of, say, anxiety or PTSD and behavioral change, all that ties back to some initial exposure or even ongoing exposure to law enforcement. And perhaps the most complicated area uh, about which I'm not a complete expert, but I love to talk about it, is uh, intergenerational trauma and hereditary transfer of trauma. Uh, we know that through this concept of epigenetics and the sort of sharing of trauma across generations, that what one generation experiences as a negative exposure to police can later go on to affect other generations as well. 
We also can see the effects of policing within the community. We'll see health inequities. Certain communities are simply not as healthy as others. They don't have access to the same resources and policing can have an impact on that. Policing can lead to more incarceration in certain populations, especially when it's differentially applied. And that means more socioeconomic strain, more trauma within the broader community and potentially more patterns of violence as well. And then finally, we have systems. So the exposure to policing overall, not just individual encounters, can lead to differences in educational opportunities for youth. If they have a parent, for example, who is incarcerated because of differential policing, or if they themselves experience mental health challenges because of their own exposures to law enforcement in different ways, they may not be able to succeed as well in that school environment and ultimately leads to less achieve, uh, achievement within a particular region. It can change the resources that are provided to that area. And it can also change the sort of patterns within the criminal legal system, such that again, people are policed differently, but it's also uh, different results in the courtroom based on what a community looks like and based on historical patterns. There's also a misconception that communities of color are inherently more violent and therefore they are policed more. And one thing we talk about in this paper briefly is that it is not really fair to say that a community is policed more heavily because of violence and crime. Why? Let's all put our sort of math hats on just for a moment. Think about it. If you have a community that is policed more heavily than another community, just statistically, that community that's policed more is going to have more of those negative outcomes, meaning you will see more people who are arrested. You will see more traffic stops and police stops. You'll see more incarceration, all because of that bigger prevalence of law enforcement actually interacting with the community. So it was a lengthy explanation. But if you look at this model, the model, you can kind of explore the, the individual steps and the breakdown of it. Um, and what I think is most exciting is that this model offers the opportunity to kind of explore the next steps of what you can do to help prevent and promote better population health, prevent the actual poor outcomes that can be short and long term. I can really appreciate kind of the model, particularly in the context of, of what's been happening geopolitically. Uh, you know, you kind of have a real shift in, uh, in a consciousness of uh, what we could agree has been going on, right? It's just kind of more in a consciousness of, of society. Uh, and there's this real po polarity in, uh, I would say, from a countrywide perspective, from my experience, uh, from how people think about police, how they handle police and experience it. And you're setting up this model of really a way to think about why that is, whether it's in rural white Western uh, Pennsylvania or whether it's, you know, Brooklyn, uh, where I grew up uh, in certain areas where people experience things. And so how do you think this this can uh, further steps that this can help us? Because some of the things I'm thinking about, because I'm always looking to have a discussion, particularly on, uh, as I as I see, the, the right or left side of the bell curve of any one argument. And so how do you think this will be helpful for uh, from one end where someone may say you need to defund police, where the other ones say, uh, you know, you give as much funding to police as possible. So how, how does this get utilized? How does this bring unity to a, a very, we, we all would think would be kind of a pretty sedate kind of reasonable kind of conversation? Absolutely. You know, I think this lays out how complicated the relationship is between law enforcement and a community. And to me, it's just a perfect demonstration of all the ways, not only that police affect communities, but the ways that we ask law enforcement to step into roles in our population that perhaps they shouldn't. And I think particularly for, for providers, clinical providers, and for mental health providers, we can think about the fact that a lot of those touch points between community members and law enforcement are going to be somewhat negative because somebody is calling another on another individual. Somebody may be in a mental health crisis. And we are asking law enforcement to step in and do something that frequently officers do not have the skill set or the training or the resources to do. So when I look at this model, what I see is a call for reforming the way that our law enforcement structures 
interact with the population. There are so many communities across the country that have these great programs where uh, crisis counselors or social workers are going out with officers on particular calls and they're helping people in mental health distress rather than having someone step in in armor with a firearm or another weapon. And it totally diffuses a situation. It can have a tremendous impact, not only on that individual, but on the entire community. I myself don't want to pick up the phone and call 911 when I see somebody in a mental health crisis, particularly if they're a person of color, given the statistics around uh, poor outcomes in those interactions between an officer and a person of color. But if I know that I can call and I'm going to have a mental health provider out in the field working with that person, that's wonderful. It's providing people in the community what they need, but it's also letting officers off the hook. It's letting them realize they don't have to step in and do this work. We're giving them this opportunity to focus on other aspects of policing where their efforts are really necessary. I think ultimately we've kind of forced law enforcement to be this really big catch-all for a lot of things in our population. And I think that often is a, a pressure point so a lot of this work that I've done is actually based on work I did with uh, police chiefs, officers, and some federal uh, military folks around the country to understand the role of law enforcement overall. And the message I kept hearing over and over again is we want to be doing better, but we don't have the resources, and we also don't think we're supposed to be doing all of these things. So to me, this is a great roadmap for how we start parsing out pieces that actually could be done by other groups in our population. I'll give you one other great example, which is traffic. We don't necessarily need police officers doing traffic stops or you know, checking on the highway, doing speed stops. That doesn't have to be police officers. We could have officers doing other work and then sort of diffuse those interactions and touch points, which often can lead to poor outcomes. This is a great way for us to acknowledge the hard work that officers are trying to do, to build in structures to support them, to give them the training that they need, and also to make sure that our community is maximally safe. You make an excellent <clears throat> an excellent point, uh, Dr. Simkis, when you talk about the need for resources. And one thing that comes to mind, especially is these um, mobile crisis units that we have here in our county and are very lucky to have, but not every county has those resources. So um, I know that one of our neighboring counties, even here in Western Pennsylvania, um, their mobile crisis is Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., which is just, you know, a real shame. I don't know how else to put it. Uh, because a lot of times, you know, people don't have a, a mental health crisis during business hours, so to speak, or at a time that's, you know, on a weekday between 9am and 5pm. And so, you know, having access to someone 24 seven, um, having those resources in your community, so that you can reach out to the, the, the highly trained, the highly qualified, you know, mental health, behavioral health clinicians during those times when you need them and not calling 911, I think is something. So, you know, how can, how can people um, advocate for that? Or how can we, you know, get folks to, to how can we bring this to kind of a, a platform, so to speak, by using what you've identified and then, you know, bringing this to the forefront where, you know, it becomes the norm that like every town has a, you know, 24 seven police station, so to speak, that they also have a 24 uh, seven behavioral health crisis team. That is such a great question. I think it's the, the trillion dollar question in reality. Let's put this into context. There are over 18,000 law enforcement agencies in this country, and there is no central federally monitored structure among those. There's massive variability. Some of them are comprised of one officer or they get half an officer who kind of covers two different districts. Others have thousands of staff, both civilian and frontline who are doing work. And establishing any kind of norms for these agencies is really hard to do. In fact, if you look at the data we collect on deaths related to law enforcement interactions, that's not even federally gathered consistently. There are some ways you can kind of do it, and this is some work that I've, I've done and many of my colleagues have tried to do as well, but it's not perfect. So to standardize across all of these agencies is unlikely, but to find allies in agencies where these are particularly difficult challenges, I think is possible. And I think one of the more 
challenging things for some folks to swallow is this concept that we can't change the police without the police. We need to identify people in law enforcement who want to work with mental health crisis units, with social workers, with statisticians, with people who want to start exploring new ways to reform and evolve. I think the best approach to really answer your question is to, for local communities, have mental health folks who are interested in doing this work, reach out to local law enforcement agencies, have a conversation, see what maybe they already have in store, or if there are other community partnerships that are already happening, and try to build on those directly with those law enforcement agencies. I suspect that making a national norm or campaign is going to be challenging, but there are also some great organizations nationally, both for clinicians and mental health care communities, but also for law enforcement as well. And having these sorts of conversations in those spaces is how that allyship and that partnership is built. You know, when you look when you look at the model and you talk about these partnerships, you know, you know, I speak from a little bit of a context of being part of a council that built the local police department, a smaller one. And, you know, the comments been stewing in my head. You talk about kind of the highway, taking the, the, the police off the highway for speeding. And I think one way is in New York, they did it really well is with cameras is one way of doing that. But there's other things with drug interdiction and as well as others. And I understand the model is really trying to address and let me know if I'm wrong with this, really the inequalities of racial and economics and how that all plays into it. And how do you bring balance? But how do you balance that with the public safety perspective of where does that balance lie as far as going one way or the other? So if you do take, for example, someone off the, the highway, so you're going to address the issue of speeding because you put cameras. But what happens if there's uh, I'm gonna, Amber Alert? What happens if someone's uh, between here and some part of Ohio and Western PA uh, trafficking drugs? How do you address that and that balance? Wow, that's a great question. And I think you have interpreted the model correctly. The idea is it should encompass all of those contextual factors, including the structural racism, the inequities in access to care, the uh, socio sociocultural factors within a community. So I think you hit the nail on the head. The balance between where law enforcement should and should not be is such a huge conversation. And I think the first point I'll make is that we have to have all of the right voices at the table. And that includes law enforcement, that includes community activists, that includes healthcare providers, legal, uh, legal representation as well, politicians. I think there has to be a little bit of everybody at the table. We are so good at talking at ourselves in groups where we are excited and have people who can uh, share our thoughts and we sort of get excited and don't speak outside of our bubbles. Part of it is getting everybody to the table. The next part is remembering that the system of policing has been around for centuries. And some of the very first structures in the United States from the days of you know, colonial times had to do with policing, had to do with slave patrols and protecting property. And if you haven't read it and you're interested, I strongly recommend reading Radley Balco's book, Rise of the Warrior Cop. It's an excellent book and written by a journalist who can provide you a lot more history on the history of the institution. So the institution of policing is really ingrained not only in our nation, but in the countries around the world. This is not something new that is going to be easily dismantled. The roots of policing go quite deep. And there are reasons, as you said, that we have policing structures in our society. The question is how do we help those structures evolve over time to meet the needs of our population, to grow with our own collective consciousness around equity and justice and those are big questions. And I really do think a lot of it has to happen at the community level so that community members and law enforcement are seeing the same picture. And that's challenging to do. There's a lot of trust that's been lost, rightfully so. There's a lot of discomfort, a lack of interest in having conversations on both sides of this very challenging coin. And it is my hope that a model like this will allow people to look at their differing opinions and see how they actually can tie together and have a really good conversation. I think so often we think we're seeing past each other. We think we're talking past each other on this issue of how police engage with the community. When in reality, there's actually quite a lot that we have in common, but it is that extremist desire to be heard and to be screaming that, that often makes it really hard to hear each other. 
Well, thank you so much for your time today and discussing your research with us. I do have to ask, uh, what topics are you planning on studying next? I love that question. So I work uh, in a department of health. So my work is somewhat guided by my agency, but I'll tell you what one of my pet projects is going to be. Uh, I am currently very excited to be looking some more at the concept of stigma in public health. How do we as public health agencies, as practitioners, perpetuate patterns of stigma and bias in the work that we do? And how can we help to uh, dismantle some of those patterns? Most specifically, I'm interested in looking at weight stigma and fat phobia and how public health and medicine and uh, clinical providers around the country can do a better job of not only dismantling, but proactively creating a society that is kinder and more inclusive of people in fat bodies. Well, we look forward to following back up with you uh, during your research so that we can hear uh, afterwards everything that you've concluded and looked into. So. Uh, please do stay in touch. And uh, before we go, also, I would like to share that uh, our listeners can access your article if they'd like on ResearchGate. Is that correct? That's correct. Wonderful. And the title of your article, again, is The Adverse Effects of Policing on Population Health, a Conceptual Model. So thank you so much, very, very much, Dr. Simkis, for being with us today. And we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. And thank you so much for joining us uh, to our listeners on this week's episode of The Barrier Breakdown. We look forward to our next episode and we hope that you all stay safe and healthy. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Barrier Breakdown, Disrupting Mental Health. Listeners can find all of our episodes on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Podbean. For more information and to learn about upcoming continuing education events, check out our website, cbicenterforeducation.com, our Facebook pages, Cognitive Behavior Institute and CBI Center for Education, as well as our Instagram at Cognitive Behavior Institute and our Twitter at CBI underscore Pittsburgh. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. We hope you'll tune in for another guest next week.